So imagine living in a walking world. Imagine walking to a health clinic or sending your kids to walk to school. Imagine walking to work or to the market. And I'm not talking about that really cool urban space like we're here in Iowa City in the Ped Mall. I'm talking about what if those walks were several hours or several days? That is the reality for over one billion people around the world. For one in nine, they lack access to the very basic transportation networks that you and I rely on. And for those people, there's a direct connection between poverty and isolation. And their ability to reach some of the most basic fundamental human services, their basic rights, are denied simply because they cannot reach those places. This kind of inequality drives me every single day. Granted, I'm a transportation engineer, so it resonates really closely. Um, but I really don't want to sit here and talk to you today about poverty or even rural isolation. I want to talk about those causes and those issues that drive us and our relationship to the other people and other organizations that are also trying to achieve the same outcomes that we believe in. So I got my start here in Iowa City uh, at the University of Iowa. I was an engineering student and experienced firsthand through living in Fiji what it looked like to live in the walking world. I came back and I'm like, oh, we can make a big difference. Five of my best friends and I got together, convinced a lot of folks that we could do the un unbelievable and build a bridge in the middle of a rural area in Peru. We raised $20,000. Uh, didn't quite know what we didn't know, but had one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. My life was forever changed. I experienced firsthand what it meant to go into a community half a world away and to use my engineering background and my passion to help people to make the lives different for those community members in Yavina, Peru. And I came back to Iowa City, I was getting settled, really proud, lots of pats on the back. And I was like, wow, that was, that was just so amazing. Um, I want to do that again. I want to build another bridge. And I sat with that. I chewed on what it meant for me to want to build another bridge. And in the sea of need, hundreds of thousands of communities lacking ba basic transportation networks, I wanted to be part of the solution. And I chewed on that again. I was like, well, what is the value that five American university students played? Was it really important for the community of Yavina, Peru? But what dent did that put in the global challenge and that global need? And I began to kind of think about, you know, what is this process by which we largely designed, fundraised for, and mobilized and built 
a project half a world away without so much as thinking about all of those engineering students right there in Peru. And all of those engineers that work every single day in the communities around Yavina. We never even called the municipalities to ask, well, what's your transportation network plan look like? What are the hundreds of bridges that you guys need and what's your plan to achieve that end goal? I started really thinking about, you know, was I part of that sustainable solution or was I getting caught in the trees? If you take a step back and look at the forest and realize the scope of the challenge ahead of you, I think it's really important to realize the role of each person in each project and even more importantly, the power of understanding the others that want to do the same and coming together as one. And I think, for me, at the very crux of the issue is that in charity, there is a power dynamic. There's a giver, there's a receiver, and any time there's that kind of relationship, the person of power, always, the person of, that is giving is always the power player. That person can always remove the ability to give. And in the circumstance of building a bridge in Peru, for as long as I'm alive and as I can convince all of you to help me go down to Peru to build bridges, I'll continue to build them. But what about the resources that exist in Peru? And what about all of the knowledge and skills of the people that live in that region? I think we missed a huge opportunity. Luckily, I, I'm, I didn't quit. I think a lot of people in organizations have those moments where they're like, oh shoot, this didn't go exactly as I planned. <laughs> um, but I, I did what a lot of young people do. I kind of looked around. Um, should I just quit? Or should I think about maybe a better way to do this work? And I uh, came across Tom's shoes. And funnily enough, I found a lot of parallels between bridges and shoes. I'd like to tell you about that this morning. Looking at Tom's, they came on the market and they were wildly popular. I mean, for the first time, there's a somewhat comfortable, we'll call it maybe stylish, shoe that all of us had access to at pretty much any local shoe store run down there and you get your pair of shoes and this company's blowing up, they're wild, they're everywhere, they're growing. And best of all, for each one of us that bought a pair of shoes, there's a barefooted child somewhere in the world that now has their first pair of shoes. Win, 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 right? It's like, how could you screw that up? Um, and I, I'm a firm believer, I think it's amazing. But critics started coming out of the woodworks. Tom's was insensitive to the local supply chain. Tom's wasn't really considering that they were creating an economy of aid, where not only are these shoes being given out, but now there's dependency on those shoes. So now we need Tom's for when our children's feet grow and when our shoes become worn out. And Tom's had some pretty tough questions ahead of them. Do they ignore the critics? They sweep it under the rug? They, you know, drop the charity model, they've got a good business, you know, forget that, that was a good way to get started. Do they close shop? God, I hope not, I wear them all the time. Um, no, they did none of those things. They asked really tough questions and they decided to listen. They did what I'd consider a pivot. They asked their communities, the beneficiaries, the people that wear the shoes, what it is that they need. And they talked to the partners, the people that distributed these all over the world. How can we be a more integrated part of the economies? And I think most importantly, they took a step back and asked, what is the change we hope to see in the world and how are we going to achieve that? And they, in this pivot, made a decision. As of January of last year, they started manufacturing shoes in Haiti. And by the end of 2015, they're gonna be manufacturing at least 30% of all their buy one, give one shoes in the countries where they get them out. And this is just so amazing. This means that the entire supply chain is influenced. Everyone from the vendors that are supplying the material to those who are actually putting the shoes together, the truck driver going out and distributing them. It's no longer a fly in, fly out. And I think that that, to me, is such a success story. It's not necessarily that I believe in giving out shoes or even that the greatest issue in the world is the barefooted children running around but I love a culture 
that can ask honest questions and listen to their supporters and realize that in your service, there's always opportunity to do more. And there's always opportunity for growth. So bringing us back to bridges, I'm not a shoe girl, I'm a bridge girl. Um, we also had some pretty tough questions. I think as, a, as an organization, we didn't want to just build bridges and be a source of dependency. We talked to our communities. We met with and workshopped with municipalities and said, hey, how do you guys plan to build these? What small or large role could we play in helping empower you to build your own bridges? And I am extremely grateful for having the opportunity as a young engineering student to experience another culture. And I'm forever indebted to be able to know that my engineering skills know how to actually put things together, change the way I looked at the world. But I'm most proud to be associated with an organization that realizes that this is a lot bigger than I and me. And to be part of something that is we. Considering that our team is not only a team here in the United States, but it's a team that's in Haiti, it's a team that's in Guatemala. It's part of a global community in Rwanda. And what the change we hope to see in the world is not gonna be just coming from America, it's gonna be as a team effort. Understanding the roles that each of us play and the value that each of us bring to the table. To be quite honest, I'm also most indebted to the supporters, my peers, and my colleagues that every day know that we haven't quite figured it out. So I'm gonna wrap up and leave you with a few short things of homework, if you will. Go home tonight and think about what are those issues that drive you? particularly those that may already have called you to action or the ones that you've been thinking about doing something about. And envision what a world would look like if you achieved that dream. Maybe it's an entire world that everyone has houses because you love Habitat for Humanity. Or maybe no one is homeless. There are thousands and thousands of issues and many, many, many ways to give. But each of us have things to give, whether it's time, treasure, or talent, or a combination thereof. If we are called or driven into a one topic issue, and each of us committed to do just one thing, the world would be a very different place. I encourage you, find like-minded people. Not everyone here is as passionate about bridges as I am and always will be, but I think that there's a lot to gain from mentors getting together, from educators getting together, from international development professionals getting together, and envisioning a world that creates a massive amount of change because we look at it as a we, not as a me. Thank you.